Welcome everyone. My name is Pam Clough and I am an advocate with Environment Washington. Thank you so much for joining the fourth and final webinar in Environment America's Meet Our Ocean webinar series. This month, June, it's Ocean Month. Uh, we've been taking some time to learn about our oceans from the wildlife that inhabit our waters, from whales, sea otters, seals, and more, to the ecosystems that provide homes to all of the wildlife within our oceans, from the underwater mountains and canyons to coral reefs. And today, our focus will be on kelp, which create underwater forests that are essential foundations for oceanic habitats all around the world. So I moved to Washington State from the East Coast. I grew up outside of Philadelphia going to the Jersey Shore. Um, it has a special place in my heart, but Washington um, is home for me uh, for about three years now. And one of the things that was immediately apparent when, when I moved to Washington was just how large the trees are in, in our state on our terrestrial forests. Um, these are all photos that I've taken in my outdoor adventures. I love spending time outside and getting out into the woods. Uh, anytime I have friends or family members visit me here for the first time, the size of the trees is one of the first things they comment on. Um, they're massive. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in our forests and a lot of us who have spent time in the woods ha has a firsthand understanding of the richness of biodiversity that our forests support, no matter where you are, you know, whether it's mushrooms or vegetative undergrowth and wildlife, owls to black bears, and, and there's just so much life. Um, and the ocean and all that it holds has a similar magnificence. Um, but for those of us who aren't divers yet, uh, the wonders of our underwater forests aren't quite as accessible, but they're just as incredible. So today we'll hear from scientists and policymakers about multiple kelp forests that can be found right off of the continental US. We'll hear about why kelp forests are a critical place um, and a critical piece of the broader ecosystems, why kelp forests are at risk, and what solutions we have available to us to restore these foundational ecosystems. So with that, I will introduce our speakers. Uh, today, I am joined by Dr. Whitman, Dr. Kristen Elsmore, and Washington State Senator Liz, Liz Lovelett. Uh, first, we'll hear from John about Cash's Ledge, which is an area in an underwater mountain range off the coast of uh, New England, and that's home to a great diversity of life. Uh, then we'll hear from Kristen about her work with California's kelp forests, and last, we'll hear from Senator Liz Lovelett from Washington State. And Liz, uh, Senator Lovelett will speak to how we can address the challenges facing kelp forests and why that's so important. So again, we'll have some time left at the end for you to ask all of our panelists questions. So please write your questions in the question and answer box uh, throughout the webinar, and we'll field those on the latter half of uh, this hour long webinar. So now I'm excited to introduce uh, Dr. John Whitman of Brown University. Dr. Whitman's a marine ecologist who studies seafloor communities. His work is aimed at understanding how these communities function, what species live there, who are the important players, and what needs protecting so that we can maintain a diverse and healthy ecosystem. He's been diving on Cassius Ledge for over 45 years and places an emphasis on training future scientists in field ecology work. So with that, John, I'll pass it over to you to tell us more about your work. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Pam. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and uh, tell you about one of the most amazing underwater places in the world, uh, which is Cassius Ledge. And um, it's located about 80 to 90 miles offshore in the Gulf of Maine, um, which is what you see here. 
Uh, the arrow shows the location. It's pretty much straight offshore if you know the New England coast from uh, Portsmouth and uh, south of, uh, of uh, Port straight out from Portsmouth, New Hampshire and down from Portland, Maine. And I'm gonna take you on a dive to Caches uh, to show you what the kelp forest is like. I'll talk about uh, why kelp forests are important in terms of the ecosystem services uh, they provide and um, introduce some of the biodiversity of this area. So um, it's out in the middle of the ocean. I mean, you're way offshore, you can't see land. And we put these buoys down uh, to mark the dive site. Cassius Ledge is really an underwater mountain range. I mean, it's really, um, the really hills, maximum 800 feet high. Uh, but it's quite current swept. So you jump off the stern of the ship and you swim like crazy for that buoy, which you can see here up at the surface, pull yourself down sometimes hand over hand and the strong currents revitalize the life there and provide a lot of nutrients for uh, what is the densest and um, highest biomass kelp forest at these depths, which is about 45 to 60 feet in the entire uh, Northwest Atlantic. So um, it's just really remarkable. Uh, there you see some divers putting down cameras and uh, some of these photos by Brian Scarry and Brett Seymour um, bring it to life. So this is a short video. It's kind of Zen-like and um, it shows you what it's like to be under the kelp canopy. These, these plants are five to six meters tall. Uh, and those, that's a bed of blue mussels that just settled. And you can see the current swaying back and forth. I've been fortunate to dive there for a very long time, uh, over 40 years. And I've gone there with some of the most experienced underwater photographers in the world. And when they get to the bottom, they just kind of lie on their backs and take it in. Um, it's kind of like an underwater jungle. So, uh, oops, this is what uh, it looks like in side view, uh, these tall stipes with the fronds of kelp waving in the current. Uh, the bottom is covered with red algae and bottom dwelling invertebrates like sponges. It's very, very productive. And uh, so we've been studying it uh, intensively since about 19, uh, sorry, uh, 2015. Um, I first collected data there in the 70s. And uh, that's me putting out a quadrat. Um, it's a meter square, so it's about the size of a typical dining room table. And we count the number of kelp species in it. So that's the way we survey the abundance of the kelp. And kelp are very, very important. Um, like forests on land, they provide a habitat structure that's very productive, a sheltering space uh, for a lot of animals. And uh, so they increase productivity, uh, primary productivity, they're plants. Um, it's an edible forest, uh, also like forests on land, but the species eating the forest are sea urchins and amphipods. Um, and then the kelp breaks down and drifts to the deep parts of Cassius Ledge and feeds filter feeders like clams um, and other small invertebrates. Another role or ecosystem services of kelp forests is that they're so dense that they actually reduce the impact of uh, high waves and currents. So they actually buffer uh, the, co the coastline um, from destructive wave action, which really is an important role because uh, the ocean is predicted to increase in storminess in the future. So one of the most obvious ecosystem services is the habitat provision and there you see a rock crab hiding among the, the stipes of the kelp. 
Um, a lot of the mobile invertebrates are eaten by fish and uh, the refuge from predation provided by the kelp is really important. Um, certainly kelp forests around the world increase biodiversity because you have all these animals hiding in the kelp forest, eating the kelp forest, and benefiting from the detritus that they uh, provide as they break down. Uh, just in terms of invertebrate diversity, not plant diversity, uh, Cassia Sledge is a biodiversity hotspot. We've shown that uh, there are more species there of sea anemones, and those are bright orange sponges, and animals called bryozoans, which are kind of like encrusting corals. Um, higher diversity on Cassia Sledge than anywhere else offshore in the Gulf of Maine at that depth. And certainly uh, one of the most important roles of kelp forests globally is they provide a habitat uh, for fish. And this is a nursery habitat where they can grow up, um, have a lot of food and uh, live in a, a reduced uh, predation habitat by hiding in the kelp. One of the unusual features of Cassius Ledge are these red cod. So in this beautiful photo taken by Brian Scary, you can see the um, very reddish cod that comes from carotenoid pigments in the um, organisms that it eats. Another reason Cassius Sledge supports so many species and is a biodiversity hotspot is there are an awful lot of different habitats compacted in a small area. So steep, ledge from about uh, 20 meters down to 100 meters. And in a small area, you can see this kind of horseshoe shaped area of Cassius Ledge. It's about uh, 25 miles long. So there's a shallow rocky ridge covered with kelp. The kelp uh, uh, doesn't have enough light to grow below about 30 meters. Then there are boulder fields, just as if you're walking up a mountain slope on land. You know, there's like a talus slope, big boulders, um, and sand and gravel and muddy basins. So because there are all these different habitat types, if each habitat has its own special set of species, the overall biodiversity of the area is going to be greater. Um, in terms of some of our study results, um, you almost don't need data to compare these two pictures and see the huge differences. There's a kelp forest at a coastal site in the Gulf of Maine, and you see there's a lot of red algae and very short shotgun kelp, where out of Cassius Ledge, you know, the kelp are so tall that it really is a jungle. Um, in terms of numbers, it's many times higher density, so more plants on that dinner table uh, size quadrat, 150 times higher on Cassius Ledge, the number of kelp plants, almost 4,000 times higher on Cassius Ledge in terms of the weight of kelp. Um, so it's really, it's a super unique place. And in fact, uh, we've shown from these, these data that it's uh, got the highest density and biomass of kelp in the entire Western North Atlantic, at least uh, in terms of what we know so far of surveyed and published data. Like the kelp, uh, there are many times more fish, higher fish densities out on Cassius Ledge uh, that just focus on the orange bars. Those are the Cassius Ledge site in terms of cod, pollock, and cunner. And these purple data points are the densities of, uh, of the biomass of fish in the coastal zone. So we do these transects, um, in particular, my uh, colleague, Robbie Lamb, they're 50 meters long and we get really high numbers of fish in 50 meters offshore. If we were to achieve the same biomass of species in that 50 meters um, in the coastal zone, we'd actually have to swim about uh, five kilometers. Uh, so it's really remarkable.
as remarkable as it is, it's very vulnerable. Um, <clears throat> when I first started working out there, uh, there was a lot of trolling disturbance, particularly in the deeper communities. We, uh, we used to work in submarines in the very deep areas. And um, I had the interesting experience of setting up an experiment at 300 feet it was kind of a station with a, a locator on it. And while we're underwater, the locator showed the station was moving away from us. We were stationary in the sub. And within an hour, it was trawled away. Um, so you can get an idea how intense the trawling disturbance is. Luckily, the New England Fishery Management Council has prohibited trawling in uh, the exact area of Cassius Ledge. However, it's not permanent protection. And the point I wanna make from this slide is that we showed through some time series uh, modeling that some of the species take 260 years uh, to recover if they're knocked off the bottom by storms or uh, by trawling disturbance. Um, certainly, if you're from New England, you've heard the news that the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than um, anywhere else in the world's ocean. Uh, it's just astonishing and sort of depressing. Uh, there you see the trend. And in fact, during our study period, uh, we caught the effect of the 212 um, uh, heat wave, where temperature was about two and a half degrees higher than the normal. And uh, that's devastating for kelp because they require cold water uh, to grow and reproduce. And there you see some pictures of the aftermath of the 212 heat wave. And what happened was the kelp looked frosted. You could see they're uh, whitish. These are colonial bryozoans and invader growing over them that led to the breakage of the kelp. And also, um, it reduced their photosynthesis. So uh, the kelp forests in the Gulf of Maine and caches as well are, are threatened uh, by these warming events. And there you see the downward trend in density of kelp on caches sludge since 1987. So uh, we think, and many um, scientists and uh, people in the, in the public um, from all walks of life, think that Cassius Ledge is such a special marine ecosystem that it warrants uh, permanent protection. And um, that's all I have. Thanks for your attention. And I will uh, be happy to take questions later. Thank you so much, John. Uh, next, we're going to turn to Dr. Kristen Elsmore, a senior environmental scientist with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife's Marine Region, working on kelp restoration and management in California. Kristen earned her PhD in ecology at the University of California, Davis, where she explored physical and ecological consequences of kelp loss. With over a decade of experience working in California's iconic kelp forest systems, she has and continues to leverage kelp restoration as a tool to inform the ecology and management of nearshore resources. So, Kristen, over to you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? All right. And can you see my screen? Sure can. Excellent, okay. Well, thank you so much, Pam, for that intro and for having me as a panelist today. Um, as Pam said, I'm Senior Environmental Scientist with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And today I'll be sharing with all of you a little bit about California's iconic kelp forest ecosystems, uh, some of the challenges that they're facing and what actions are underway to protect and enhance this natural resource. So, um, so John was talking about some kelp forests that are much shorter than what we, we have on the coast here in California. Uh, we also have some shorter kelps, but um, the two dominant kelp species that we have that are forming uh, kelp canopies all the way up to the sea surface are giant kelp and bull kelp. 
And these two species are, are really, really important to California's ecosystem, near shore ecosystems. And so on the left here, we have giant kelp, uh, Macrocystis pyrifera. And this is formed, uh, these form forests predominantly in Southern California, all the way up into Central California. And then starting in Central California and working its way up through the Northern region of California, we have those forests dominated by bull kelp. Um, which you can see in the cartoon on the right here. And so there's um, some key differences between these two species, uh, thinking kind of more about the shape and morphology and how they sit within the water column. So giant kelp, as you can see in the little cartoon, has lots of um, blades, leaf-like blades, and little air bladders that are suspended throughout the water column. I have a picture behind me of a, one whirling. And so they have a lot of biomass all the way throughout the water column, whereas bull kelp on the right hand side here has just one air bladder um, all the way up at the surface and all of their blades are concentrated in that upper region of the water column. So the, they look a little bit different under, underwater when you're diving through them. They're sometimes, well, I would say they're probably equally as tangly to swim through. <laughs> um, and so these, these two species, both extend all the way throughout the water column and create habitat, as John had mentioned, for hundreds of other organisms. And they have lots of different layers to them. The forest is not just made up of kelp, um, but it has lots of other species that, that build in that habitat structure as well. And they provide a broad suite of ecosystem services, including here in California, certainly supporting commercial and recreational fisheries such as rockfish, red urchin, lobster, and previously abalone, um, and also harvest of kelp itself. So that's also sort of a fishery, if you will, in California. And they also hold cultural and economic significance to California's tribes and coastal communities. So they've been a really, really core part of California um, uh, for Californians for a very long time. Unfortunately, though, California's kelp forests, um, much like a lot of other kelp forests in the world, are threatened by several different stressors, including ocean warming. So again, similar to John, the, the forest that John works in, uh, temperature is a really big stressor for kelp. And related is poor upwelling. So you don't get that cool nutrient-rich water that kelp really needs to survive and grow and thrive. We've also experienced some pretty severe predator die-offs um, with the Pictopodia, the sea star in particular, as following the uh, sea star wasting event that some of you may have heard of. And um, coinciding with that also is a huge increase in purple sea urchin. So we have a pretty severe urchin barren problem. So the habitat is barren or devoid of anything but urchin is kind of where that name comes from. Um, and then as well as sedimentation and point and non-point uh, source pollution. So those are some pretty big stressors that we're dealing with here um, on the coast of California for kelp. And so some of the impacts of these stressors have resulted in pretty severe declines in kelp forests, particularly in Northern California, but in um, various areas along the coast of California. And so um, you can see here in this graph, this is a time series of canopy cover that was derived from satellite data. And so this is just kelp canopy cover over time, dating back to 1984 and going through 20 into a little bit of 2021. And you can see this dashed red line, so this really critical time point where we had really warm waters and that coincided with and just likely facilitated the loss of that predator, the sea star, the sunflower star, and a boom in urchins. And you see this huge, pretty extreme and persistent decline in the northern coast of California. And you can see indicated by this red arrow. And if you look at the other regions, we do see some declines and ups and downs, but it's pretty, pretty drastic here in northern California. And so, while I do want to take a moment to say, though, that this, these are very broad regional patterns, and as you zoom in fall closer and closer in space, the stories become more complicated. So, for example, even in northern, in the north coast, 
this really extreme decline is really driven by um, loss in kelp loss in Sonoma and Mendocino County, so two counties that make up the, that four county region of Northern California. And then the Central Coast is a, also a, a more complicated story. For example, in uh, Monterey, we have some pretty severe and concerning losses there as well. Um, but there's areas like in Santa Cruz, just north of Monterey, that are doing quite well. So it's a little bit of a complicated story about where, where the kelp is being lost and why. So that kind of brings us to where California um, has taken some action here for addressing this kelp loss. So we've taken kind of a multi-prong approach. We've developed some guiding documents, um, including the Sonoma Mendocino Bull Kelp Uh, seems like we may have, uh, Kristen may have frozen. Um, hopefully she'll come back online really quickly and that'll be a temporary problem. One of the troublesome aspects of live virtual session rather than an in-person uh, panel. Um, maybe we can give a minute for Kristen to get back on. And I know that there were a few scientific oriented questions in the chat uh, directed at um, to you, John. And I'm wondering, maybe you could answer some of those questions. One of the questions that Chris asked that I also had the same question is uh, when you were showing the two slides comparison, comparing the coastal kelp forest and the kelp forest on Cassius Ledge, why is there such higher biomass on, on Cassius Ledge? Um, well, there's several, there are two main reasons. Um, one is the coastal zone was extensively overgrazed by sea urchins um, in the 80s and before. Um, so it was luxuriant. It was never as large as uh, the kelp at, at Cassius, but I, I studied the coastal kelp forest in the in the late 70s and mid 80s, and it was quite luxuriant. But then whole fronts of green surgeons came in, and I, you know, I it was like logging. You know, I watched the forest disappear right in front of me, and biodiversity dropped. And then after that, the barrens uh, were established by surgeon grazing, a lot of invasive species came in. Mm. There's a whole progression. <laughs> it was really pretty amazing. Um, Codium, uh, which is a, a type of seaweed that's uh, invasive from Japan, uh, took over and actually replaced the kelp forest in the coastal zone functionally. And now there are a lot of uh, fouling invertebrates like sea squirts. Um, so the kelp have had a hard time coming back. And in fact, in that coastal picture, you saw the bottom was mostly red and that's an invasive red algae um, that uh, hopefully isn't as extensive on Cassius Ledge, but I haven't been out for two or three years and I'm, I'm worried that it's spread out there. Is that not the same red algae that was, um, I, you did know that there's some red algae on the bottom. Of yeah, yeah, the totally kelp. different, okay. totally different species. The red algae on, on caches are, are native. The red algae it, shown in that photo, it's Daisy Siphonia japonica, mm -hmm. and uh, it's invasive from Japan, and it's spread like wildfire. Uh, through coastal New England, both Southern and Northern. And I know, so Kristen touched on um, the decline of the, um, one of the sea stars off the coast of California leading to a proliferation of sea urchins in California. Was there a similar occurrence uh, on the New England coast that led to a proliferation of the sea urchins in the coastal um, region? Not, not really. Um, 
the, the sea stars don't control uh, the sea urchins the way they do on the West Coast. Uh, but um, there has been a die off of sea stars in the genus Asterius. I mean, it's the common underwater sea star um, in the last couple of years. And as a result, those blue mussels that I showed in the video that are pavement have, um, have tended to increase, but they're also challenged by climate change. So the Gulf of Maine has is, is really changed a lot uh, since I did my PhD uh, in the late 70s, mid 80s. I'm so sorry. Welcome back, Kristen. Lost internet. I'm so sorry, I'm gonna do it from my phone. It happens. <laughs> um, do you need assistance with sharing, screen sharing? I will just talk briefly and we will move on. I don't wanna cut yeah. into time too much um do you know where i stopped where i cut um, off whew. um john maybe so i talking about a kelp public, action plan maybe public yeah, if you were on the kelp action plan slide exactly okay thank exactly. you thank you i will be brief sorry so we have a kelp action plan uh for california which is really exciting because it highlights all of the knowledge gaps and action related to kelp restoration and next steps that we're really hoping to achieve to inform and develop our kelp restoration and management plan that will be statewide, which we're in the early stages of developing. So very exciting there. And then we've partnered with California Sea Grant and the Ocean Protection Council um, as entities within California to develop a kelp recovery research program where we are working where researchers were funded to fill some of those knowledge gaps directly um, related to management, which is really exciting. Um, we've had a couple responsive regulatory actions. So changing some of the temporarily changing recreational take of urchins um, to be potentially used as a restoration tool in California, as well as altering the commercial bull kelp regulations, the harvesting temporarily again, um, as we are kind of transitioning into building out this restoration and management plan for the whole state. And we have a lot of mapping and monitoring similar to what John uh, is doing, subtitle monitoring, as well as some canopy mapping and particularly exciting. Uh, recently, the Ocean Protection Council just uh, funded some state, the development of some statewide canopy maps with planet imagery data, which is three meter resolution remote sense data, remotely sense data, which is really exciting to get some high resolution maps of California's kelp. And then um, I guess that leads me into some of the restoration projects that we have on the ground. I won't go into detail about them right now just to get, get moving, but some key restoration tools we're exploring um, through partnerships and then other groups are also exploring our kelp enhancement through lab culturing and outplanting in the field as well as grazer suppression. So reducing urchin densities through um, partnerships with commercial divers, recreational divers, and exploring experimental traps um, to see if that can help facilitate re reducing those urchin densities and grazing pressure. Um, let's see. And then also, um, as I had mentioned, we are developing a statewide restoration and management plan. Um, and I'll just kind of leave it there and we can move on and we can yes, answer questions if they come up. Thanks, sorry about the tech glitch. Thanks, Kristen, no worries. We uh, use that as an opportunity to answer some questions around uh, John's presentation. So, um, but I'm glad you uh, left us on the note of, of restoration uh, opportunities because I'm excited to introduce Senator Lovelet. Uh, Liz Lovelet, uh, who represents the 40th Legislative District uh, in Northern Puget Sound in Washington State. Uh, and that includes San Juan and portions of Whatcom, Whatcom and Skagit counties, uh, with a focus towards fighting climate change and saving Washington State's beloved Southern resident orca population. Uh, Senator Lovelet was thrilled to work with the Washington Department of Natural Resources last legislative session on the kelp forest and eelgrass meadow conservation initiative. So not only will this new law conserve and restore 
10,000 acres by 2040. Uh, that's a big deal, everyone. Um, it will sequester massive amounts of carbon in our oceans and provide vital habitat to allow salmon and other marine life to recover and thrive. So Senator Lovelad, I'm excited to pass it over to you. Thanks so much for all the work that you've done. And yeah, tell us more about this initiative and how you got involved with health restoration. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me here today. I am not tech, tech savvy, so there will be no PowerPoint. Although uh, when Dr. Ellsmore was talking uh, about all the research that has gone on in California, it made me think of one of my favorite childhood books, which I picked up off the shelf. I'm going to show it to you. It's called Pagoo. It's the story of a hermit crab, and it's kind of one of my earliest introductions outside of growing up on an island to these near shore environments that have such incredible biodiversity. So by way of background, I live in a little town uh, off the, or uh, connected by a bridge, but on the coast of, uh, of Washington, Skagit County, and I represent the beautiful San Juan Islands, which is home to our resident orca whale. And as you can imagine, with all of the ecosystem pressures, the development pressures, the amount of people recreating in our, our water areas, it's put a huge downward pressure on those beloved megafauna. And for those of you that were watching the news around a couple of years ago, Ago, we had one of our orca mothers carrying around her dead calf for the better part of a month. And it was this beacon to our area about the necessity and the urgency of taking immediate climate action to restore and remediate our near shore habitats and make sure that they have the food that they need to survive and thrive. So a lot of what directed this effort was that we have phenomenal leadership in our Department of Natural Resources and our Commissioner of Public Lands, Hillary Franz. She's been very visionary in the way that uh, her department has focused both on the aquatic lands that they manage and on the, the terrestrial forestry lands that they manage. So I have to say, when I when I got to hear this bill come to the floor, uh, an act relating to eelgrass meadows and kelp forests, I, I mean, it, it may have well has been the title of a beautiful book of poetry, but I was so proud to be able to bring it to the floor and have people talking about the importance of these environments. Because as a person who's grown up on this island, I used to eat abalone as a kid. I watched all of the starfish waste away. And so the, the visual cues that we have been getting for decades around what is happening to our marine environments is very stark. There are just straight up species that don't exist around here anymore. As I joined our city council here in Anacortes, I had the opportunity to join another really incredible group that we have set up in Washington, which are our marine resource committees. So each coastal county around Washington state has their own MRC, and they work in conjunction with the Puget Sound Partnership and the Northwest Straits Foundation in order to help do a lot of the citizen science monitoring work around kind of the health of these environments, but then additionally has the ability to partner with governments and other agencies to bring dollars in to do these restoration projects. So for example, they have been seeding pinto abalone and our native oyster uh, in our bays and, and areas around the state to make sure that we can bring those beloved species back from the brink. Uh, that is how I ended up getting involved in this in the first place. I started running bills about derelict vessel removal, which is something that is kind of one of those wonky, unsexy policy areas. You know, when a boat sinks in our marine environment, it's an environmental environmental dereliction. I mean, it, it really is. The, the chemicals that can leach off out of the engines, out of all of the materials that are in the boats, in addition to providing navigational hazards and, and, and very real dangers to other marine users, uh, it, it, it clearly is polluting our, our environment. So have worked over the last couple of years to get some really solid funding uh, to make sure that we have the capacity to be able to continue to remove these boats. So we had, you know, for example, um, the budget in DNR used to be uh, like $5 million. We had one boat get removed in my district and it cost $4 million. There's just, it, it's so complicated to get the permits, to get the right equipment, to get the divers, to get all the expertise necessary to remove these vessels uh, without causing further environmental harm and to make sure that the that the chemicals that have the potential to leach out are, are contained. Um, also worked on an initiative with the Department of Ecology to work on reforming regulations around anti-fouling boat paints that get used on the hulls of, of boats to make sure that they don't get barnacles and other things growing on it, but which ultimately have the ability to leach into our natural environment and cause problems other places. 
So when Department of Natural Resources was ready to run this build, they came to me and I gladly ran with it. And I'm proud to say that I was able to get that bill out with only one no vote uh, out of both chambers. So this is not only something that is, is politically popular in terms of what our constituents want and what the public wants and what's right for the environment, but it also is a bipartisan issue that had tons of support at every step of the way. So what I, I hope to send you guys away with is, is the idea that these kinds of programs that help us restore our natural environment are really their win-win across the board if you can find the funding to do it. And so they were, I mean, I was really surprised. It's hard to get agency request bills uh, to have that level of, of unanimous bipartisan support, but we got it there. And, and in part, it's because I think so many of us have been bearing witness to this decline in our ecosystems over the years. Uh, so I, I it's, uh, as, as Pam was explaining, it helps to map, restore, and remediate 10,000 acres of kelp and eelgrass, which for me is really important growing up in the Padilla Bay uh, estuary, or estuary Reserve, which was as a little kid going out there uh, to take a field trip and learning about the incredible biodiversity and, and habitat importance of our estuary areas for our juvenile salmon uh, and, and realizing how much effect that has up the food chain to make sure that we're we're providing the food necessary to help bring our orca species back from the brink. So it was uh, really, for me as a legislator, it's such rewarding work. I do a lot of work around conservation um, and, and making sure that we're, we're getting back to our roots in terms of what the land used to look like. And I'll say as well, you know, Anacortes is home to two of five of our uh, oil refineries in Washington state. And so a lot of these areas that have needed to be remediated on the shoreline are, are actually because of industrial uses. And we have an incredible fund here called MOTCA, which is our Model Toxics Control Act. And so I've seen firsthand the ability for these investments to be made to remediate areas. And then 20 years down the line, they're actually very successful, robust ecosystems. And so I think that's the the, that's the takeaway I want to leave you with is that these projects really work over time. It's never going to be like it was 50 years ago or 100 years ago, but but we can continue to move forward and make sure that they are uh, they're being cared for, they're being protected, that we're we're bringing back that ecological function that not only helps our environment but brings our quality of life uh, into balance. You know, and I think about growing up as a kid, and you couldn't go to a single beach without finding purple sea starfish, sea stars. Uh, that was just the usual. You looked under every rock and there they were. Uh, you just don't see them anymore. And with my kids growing up as sixth generation to live on this island, I want to ensure that when they have their grandkids and they come to visit here, that they're still going to have these beloved and iconic species to interact with. And part of that, in, in no small part, is, is what we do with kelp and eelgrass. Uh, it's, it's been a journey, but it's a great one. And I'm happy. One of the things I love about being a legislator in Washington state, and I know that we have this in California as well, is that we get to lead the nation on creating innovative policies that other states can replicate. And, and we've seen that across the board in environmental and climate policies that we passed in Washington and California, is that the rest of the country then has a template to work with to do similar work in their states. So it does take some political will. It definitely takes some money, uh, as, all, <laughs> as all good things do. But at the end of the day, when uh, when 2040 rolls around and we have 10,000 more acres of this incredible species helping bring forth ecological vitality uh, in our areas, it, it's, it will be well worth the, the effort. And so glad to be here today. Happy to answer questions and uh, proud to be part of this esteemed panel. Thank you so much, Senator Lovelet. Um, so I want to uh, get some questions answered that uh, was asked by the audience. So um, one thing that I, I want to talk a little bit more around solutions. Um, and uh, so Jeff asked the question, are people working to designate Cassius Sledge as a marine sanctuary? So John, maybe you could speak a little bit more to that and, and the value that marine sanctuary um, and other protected designations um, play for restoring these areas. Sure, um, happy to answer. Uh, there are basically two options. <clears throat> One is to have a, a marine area designated as a marine sanctuary, and that's um, done through NOAA. Um, 
the community nominates a site and then it goes through a vetting process. Hearings uh, takes a while, but uh, it's very good and then it involves a lot of stakeholders. The other option uh, is to have it uh, nominated as a Marine National Monument. And uh, that is done by a very different process by a presidential decree through the um, Antiquities Act uh, that was set up by Teddy Roosevelt around 1906. Um, it also involves a lot of stakeholder um, opinion, but um, right now uh, there's no definite move uh, to protect it in the conservation community. Um, we did try <clears throat> a number of years ago, about five, six years ago, to have it designated as a Marine National Monument. And despite a lot of public support, and I'm talking tens of thousands of signatures and endorsements, uh, the political landscape deemed it wasn't uh, suitable for a Marine National Monument or the right time. But uh, around the same time, we got the New England Canyons and Seamounts uh, designated as a Marine National Monument. Great, thanks, John. Um, so another question that was asked in the chat uh, uh, was by El Elena. I uh, hope I pronounced your name right. Um, but I want to uh, des uh, designate that question to Kristen. Because um, Kristen, I know you talked a little bit about um, uh, limiting kelp harvesting and the question acknowledged that many products now have kelp as an ingredient. And so um, the question asks, do oceans have sufficient kelp to allow all of this extraction and how, how best to manage that? That's a really good question. And that's something we're really hoping to, to build out in our restoration and management plan. And, and so, figuring out exactly what those impacts of harvest are, and maybe it's different harvest methods because kelp has this wonderful ability to just grow so fast. That's one of the coolest things about it is, and perhaps one of the most inspiring and exciting things about restoration too, is you don't have to wait 30 years to see a forest develop. For example, bull kelp, that, that species that we have that's got a single bulb in all the blades at the surface, that is an annual species. So that means that it completes its whole life cycle every year. It starts, grows up as a little baby all the way up to the surface, releases spores or that reproductive material, and then dies and then does it again every year. So they grow very quickly. And so if you can get that restoration right, that's really exciting. And it's a quick, a quick turnaround. And so that's that's a pretty characteristic thing of giant kelp and bull kelp. Some other species of kelp are much slower growing, but um, that it varies depending on what species you're talking about. And so we're hoping to build that out, um, build out a robust, sustainable management plan for how, how to address that question. It's a really important question and um, we're hoping to, to kind of fine tune the science into our plan as well. Yeah. Thanks. I want to keep on the train of, of solutions. Uh, and another question that was asked was around sea otter introduction um, and how that could be utilized as um, help reviving kelp forests. So Kristen, are you able to speak a little bit more to what, what do sea otters have to do with kelp forests? <laughs> sure. Yeah, so sea otters play a really important role in kelp forest ecosystems. They like to eat urchins. Um, among many other things, they eat a lot of a lot of critters on the sea floor, um, but they eat they eat a lot of sea urchins and sea urchins. Um, as I mentioned, I um, I was kind of whizzing through it. Sorry, but sea urchin, per particularly purple sea urchins, have their their native species to California, so they're part of the normal ecosystem for kelp forests. But their populations have boomed, and they've kind of overtaken a lot of our rocky reef and mowed down the kelp forests. And so sea otters play this really important role where they, they consume sea urchins and they kind of help maintain those densities to be at a healthy level uh, for a kelp forest. And so, in, for example, in Monterey, 
they've played this really critical role in maintaining kelp forests that, that are still there. So some recent work that's come out of the Monterey area found that they don't maybe necessarily do a great job of flipping urchin barrens to kelp forests because urchins, when they're in this barren state, when you have just only urchins, they're hungry, they've eaten all the kelp. So there's not a lot of food around. And so, and the, when they eat a lot of food, they produce a lot of reproductive material. That's what the otters like to eat. That's what we like to eat. Um, it's called uni or roe. And so they help kind of keep that ecosystem functioning by keeping that grazing pressure down. And so that, that's kind of where they plug into the story. But in Northern California, we've lost um, our otters because we over harvested them for uh, fur, uh, for their pelts and such um, a long time ago. And so they're not part of the ecosystem right now in Northern California and they haven't been for quite some time, um, but they're still present in Central California and then in other places up in Alaska, there's definitely a lot of otters up there, so. Sounds um, like we're having some predation problems in Washington State with otters, so maybe we can ship some down to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Liz, uh, that actually, what I, I had a question around, you know, how can states work together? It seems like there are some good efforts that are happening in states across the country, and I'm sure that you know, the federal government has a role to play. So how can how can we collaborate? Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just had a, an op-ed published in the Seattle Times about creating a national biodiversity strategy because here's what we know, animals do not respect state borders. Uh, they don't respect whose jurisdiction something is under. So the more collaborative we are about our approaches, uh, you know, we do a lot of things because we're, uh, you know, so politically aligned along the West Coast. We do a lot of joint efforts in terms of climate policy, Washington State just adopted the Climate Commitment Act, which helps put us into California's cap and trade, trade program as an example. Uh, so there, there's so many different ways that we can be collaborative at all levels of government. But I, I think the, the heart of this is, you know, going back to those marine resource committees, this is generally made up of um, the natural resource folks from different local tribes, people from the county, local industrial partners, but then it's a lot of retired scientists that are out of the field that they don't want to be teaching at the, the university anymore, but they still want to be relevant and helpful to the, the remediation of these environments. So when you can work holistically down from that level of, of volunteers all the way up to the federal government to make sure that you're harmonizing grants, that you're harmonizing policy, that you're making sure that if if, you know, if we're doing something in Washington state to help protect our orca, well, we better be talking to Canada about it because we share shipping lanes and we have a lot of traffic that moves back and forth between those places. So we're stronger together than we're ever going to be doing things on our own. And I think that many people are hungry to do this kind of work. And you'd be surprised at how unlikely an ally you'll find out there. And so I guess more than anything, I'd say, don't assume that somebody won't be your ally. Uh, for, for superficial reasons, because you never know who might jump in and, and want to champion something alongside. Thanks so much, Senator Lillablet. Um, I want to uh, answer a question um, that uh, gets at some of the stressors that um, are contributing to kelp decline. So one, of, one stressor is, is water quality, which can obviously impact um, kelp forests. And so maybe John, or you know, if, if there's, if any of the other panelists want to jump in, but, you know, how do we um, address this threat, which, you know, doesn't respect sanctuary boundaries? Yeah, John, yeah, maybe I, you I can this. address that, um, if you can hear me. Yeah, the problem with rising temperatures is that um, it gets so warm in these cool temperate areas where the, the kelp live that uh, they can't reproduce. And uh, they're in the East Coast, they're normally a winter reproducing uh, time for kelp. Um, so that's one big problem. And also they actually, the kelp plant starts to degrade if it hits uh, 19 or 20 degrees C, so around 68, 69 Fahrenheit. Um, so uh, 
climate change is an existential threat to the, the structure of kelp. The actual, you know, controlling the species that eat kelp, sea urchins, et cetera, is actually way easier than uh, dealing with climate change. You know, we can't set up a marine reserve to stop climate change, but we can to say, protect predators of sea urchins or something like that. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, so, so kelp forests are threatened globally. I was part of a, a global study of kelp forests around the world. And we found that about 40% of them were declining. And um, there are multiple stressors, but increasing temperatures is, is the biggest threat. Can I add something to that as well? Uh, so one of the things that we have noticed a lot on the ground here when we talk about putting land into conservation is really being cognizant of the impact on various marine users. So, you know, outside of the Washington coast, we have a lot of land that's designated Department of, of Defense, for example. Some of them are, are the usual and accustomed lands of our, our coastal tribes, but as soon as you start talking putting things into conservation the people who utilize that space get really upset so i would just say early engagement early stakeholdering giving them a seat at the table and making sure that they you know have their voices heard often ameliorates feeling them feeling like they're blindsided by something that's being handed down to them and then it has the potential to depoliticize it and instead have it be something that that's it, it that's a value to the community that is for the community for the marine users um ultimately they're not going to have anything to fish if there's no habitat uh so you'll often find them willing partners if you engage early so just really thinking about who are the kind of outside the box people that really need to be brought in on some of these decisions so that there, there's the ability to have those, those meaningful conversations early on. Important, thanks Senator Lovelet. We have just a few minutes left um, and I want to allocate a minute for a wrap up, but I just had one quick question that I'm hoping that um, maybe some of our panelists can answer really briefly, but what gives you hope for our oceans? Maybe Senator Lovelet, you wanna just kick us off? Sure. Um, I think young people give me hope because as we've seen, I, I've had the opportunity to, to participate in these student climate marches. They're demanding action. They're not allowing, they're putting so much pressure. They're testifying at hearings. I have kids of my own that are asking, you know, what am I doing to make sure that they're going to have a planet to live on? Because I think there's a lot of, it, it's hard to find hope, especially in, in our current tumult that we're in as a nation, this moment in history. And I think when you can have something as concrete as remediating a natural environment that we all get to benefit and enjoy, uh, that is something that that people latch onto, they feel hopeful about, they know that there's an answer in there. Uh, and I, I think that that is what keeps me going on this work is that it, it really is impactful and meaningful to people and they're really excited about participating. Thank you so much. Yes, yeah, same here, if I can add to that for a second. Um, I teach a lot of students and I'm a cautious optimist in terms of uh, understanding the future. Um, I think that uh, knowledge is power. We're generating a lot of knowledge about the ocean, what makes it resilient, how biodiversity is important, how it responds to climate change. The problem, as I see it, is we have to act on that knowledge and we have to use those recommendations uh, based on years of, of research and insight. And I can add, jump in here, I think for me, on, on top of all of that, I would say the restoration space is, is really exciting and really brings a lot of hope because it's, it requires partnership and collaboration. Um, and it's so exciting to see when people get together, the creativity that comes about creative solutions. I mean, it's, we're not going to need, we're not going to have one solution that's going to fit the situation even across California, even within a single state, there's these micro habitats and they're gonna require different tools for restoration and they're gonna be presented with different stressors and different problems. You're talking about sedimentation and pollution and all of those, those different stressors are presented in different combinations along the coastline and your habitats and your species compositions are different all along the coastline. And that's just within one state. 
and it's going to require different combinations of tools. Maybe we need to reduce urchin densities and outplant on top of that. Maybe one area we only need to outplant. Maybe we don't need to reduce urchin density. So seeing the partnerships develop, helping facilitate some of those partnerships and, and really seeing a lot of the creativity unfold is, is what brings me a lot of hope. It's exciting and action-based and, um, and I just, it's, helps me yeah. keep going. <laughs> Thank you yeah. so much, Kristen. I really appreciate um, the input um, for all, all of our panelists today. Uh, apologies for, we didn't have time to get to all of the questions, but um, please feel free to follow up with us um, if you do have uh, burning questions that you want to get answered. Uh, thank you all of us, uh, everyone, for getting on to this webinar today and for anyone who uh, was enjoying our webinar series this full month. Um, if you are feeling inspired and want to do more, uh, you can sign up to be a voice for our ocean with Environment America. Uh, Kelsey, who is our Environment America's Oceans Director, um, just put a link in the chat. So Voices for Oceans receive monthly email updates and opportunities to take even more action and learn more. Um, so here you can learn about opportunities to make public comments and uh, testify and sign on to letters advocating for ocean protections and making calls to legislators and more. Uh, so check out that link in the chat. Thank you so much for everyone uh, who spoke today, who asked questions and uh, for getting on. With that, have a great day, everyone. Thank you again.